Hello and welcome back guys. I'm Linnea Lucan, Research Fellow with the Heartland Institute's Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate and Environmental Policy. In this episode, we are going to look at the other most popular renewable option that is not wind. It makes up about 5% of electricity generation in the U.S. and is very popular in California. We're a little more progressive and ahead of the curve here in San Francisco. This time, we are talking about solar power. To start, I'll give a little overview of how solar power works. There are two primary methods of power generation from solar. First, photovoltaic panels, which most people are familiar with, and they do make up the majority of utility scale generation in the United States at least. And there's also what's called a concentrating solar thermal power. The latter is where they'll use a field of those ground mounted mirrors that reflect and concentrate the sun's energy onto a receiver tower. That's the kind of power plant we see in the movie Sahara, which I'm showing on the screen, but I'll explain later why this isn't quite realistic. Like in the wind video, I'm keeping my focus here on industrial scale applications. So I'm not talking about off-grid arrays or passive solar water heating, nothing like that. The installed solar capacity in the states and also the world has quickly increased over time, hitting 843 gigawatts worldwide in 2021. However, from my quick calculations, the global average capacity factor is only about 14%. So solar panels are only producing a small percentage of their rated capacity. A large reason why the actual world average is so low is likely because countries like Africa and even some Asian nations will buy used secondhand panels um, from elsewhere like the United States, and they have a much lower efficiency than new panels. Still, using hand-me-down panels might be positive environmentally, and we'll discuss why that is later. The other reason actual solar power generation is so low is because solar is so weather dependent. It only works when the sun shines, so on cloudy days it drops or, if the clouds are passing, fluctuates. At night, it drops or disappears entirely. During shorter days in the fall and also the winter months of the year, which can be seen beautifully in that net generation chart I showed earlier, um, it drops off significantly. But peak generation is seen to be in June. So why would that be? Well, high summertime temperatures can also reduce solar electricity generation in photovoltaic panels at least. Like all electronics, they suffer from things like overheating. Um, the PV cells themselves can experience a big voltage drop in high temperatures, which causes the power output to decline. PV panels have a lifespan of about 25 years or so before manufacturers say that they begin to drop in efficiency due to age. All right, regarding costs, most sources say that renewables like solar are cheaper than traditional sources. However, you have to take a detailed look into where their numbers are coming from and what they're comparing. Comparing weather-dependent intermittent energy sources to something more stable, like coal or natural gas, is not always easy or straightforward. Most of the time, you will be given something called the levelized cost of energy. This value actually fails to reflect the realistic costs. It relies instead on a sort of idealized value. The U.S. Energy Information Administration's LCOE, which is levelized cost of energy uh, values for solar, assume people are using the best automated sun tracking panels. In reality, most large arrays are going to be fixed and almost all rooftop solar arrays are fixed, so they don't track the sun as it crosses the sky. Another example of added cost is that grid scale solar requires another energy source, one that is dispatchable to be on standby, idling, or just ever ready to ramp up when needed. In the end, when you look at reports that cover the actual reported cost of electricity from different sources, solar is actually much more expensive. This expense gap is overcome, like with other renewables, by aggressive government subsidy programs and also state mandates. These include things like the Renewable Electricity Production Tax Credit, which grants a per kilowatt hour credit for any electricity generated, the Investment Tax Credit, and state renewable portfolio standards, which mandate increasing amounts of renewable electricity. All of these end up reducing the direct cost of solar, but we, the taxpayers, end up covering the difference. Despite the real world costs of solar power, could it still be worth it just on environmental grounds? 
advocates say that because solar doesn't generate any carbon dioxide during electricity power production, it's worth some expense, especially government spending, to encourage or to enforce solar to take up a larger portion of our electricity generation. As with any energy source, I have some problems with this argument. Like with wind, solar is a land-hungry energy source. One study found that for every megawatt of power produced, solar requires 43.5 acres of land. This value includes not only the installation itself, but things like transmission lines, mining, and disposal too. This is about three times as much as coal, nuclear, or natural gas. Unlike wind turbine plants, solar requires more coverage of the ground, and they can have an effect on the plant growth in their shade, and most places keep the ground pretty well barren anyway for ease of maintenance. Because they rely on photovoltaic cells, batteries, and other associated electronic components, solar panels contain a lot of rare earth minerals and materials that the Environmental Protection Agency classify as hazardous waste. Like the modern issue of other electronic waste, most solar panels are difficult, if not impossible, to recycle. In places like India and China, where lead batteries are more common, there's a major threat from lead pollution. In addition, large battery banks, which have been proposed to back up power for renewables like solar, are prone to um, spontaneous fires, <laughs> which uh, quickly get out of control and are pretty difficult to extinguish. In terms of threats to animals, it might come as a surprise that solar does present a danger to birds. The most dramatic example comes from some of the largest concentrated solar plants. Witnesses actually report seeing birds literally burst into smoke and flame, or at least are singed, upon flying at the altitude near the tower um, where the most concentrated heat is. You can go online and see some pretty graphic images of this, but I'm not going to show them here. Of course, were it accurate to life, Matthew McConaughey would probably not survive the clip I showed earlier, making Sahara a very different kind of movie. Large arrays of photovoltaic panels can appear to birds like bodies of water. This is termed a lake effect, and sometimes birds will die on impact with those surfaces when they mistake it for a lake. Besides birds, bats, and insects, other species may be impacted because of the land use of the panels. One that has come up in the news lately is the threatened desert tortoise. Biologists have warned that large solar plant sites in the deserts of California and Nevada might actually make it impossible for that reptile to migrate and find breeding partners. They already have a hard enough time as it is. Finally, one issue that's often overlooked for solar is the fact that it actually uses a ton of water. Large-scale solar plants, both for CSP and photovoltaic panels, require a ton of water to keep the panels clean of dust and debris, which can reduce their output mere rainwater can't be counted on, especially when you see that these are going up in desert locations where a plant is maybe in a remote area. CSP actually uses more water than almost any other kind of electric power plant. To sum up, although some applications and locations of solar might make sense, industrial scale solar is not as environmentally friendly or effective as its advocates claim. If your primary concern is carbon dioxide emissions, at the point of electricity generation anyway, there are other electric power generating options that take up a lot less land, use less water, and provide more stable power. As I've said before, there's going to be a risk with any energy source, so you really have to do a cost-benefit analysis to determine which one you want to depend on, or combinations of multiple, who knows. Anyway. As always, these videos are based on longer research that I have done uh, that have a lot more detail and the hard numbers. The papers and sources are going to be available at the heartland.org website, and there should be a link in the description as well. Also, in case you're not already watching us, you definitely should tune in here on Fridays at noon central for Climate Change Roundtable, where myself and some colleagues discuss all sorts of climate-related topics, including energy topics, and on occasion we also get some really cool guest experts, so I highly suggest that you come check us out. As always, you guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.